Well, welcome back. Last week you did bring the Red Bulls. We'll mm-hmm. talk about that. I did have it after. And we you recorded. loved it. And you already drank yours for no, this episode. No, that's not true. <laughs> I did drink it. Oh, it's so sad. I'm not as much of a fan, I will say. It's, like, you, it's an acquired taste. It, did not, it, 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 it was like Smarties and Sprite or Smarties and like a really sweet great, like a fruit drink. Kids like a Capri Sun in a Capri Sun. But it didn't give me... I wings? Didn't, nah, I did not get wings. But you said that you sometimes it makes you. That did, yeah. I have. Did you take I, a nap after? Yeah, no. It <laughs> mellowed me out. Red Bull in a nap. Yeah. It's like I, I drank one before bed to calm me down, so I didn't <laughs> think all night. Um, all right, so here we are. Uh, we're getting ready to start a new book. Bef- uh, uh, before we do that, we had said we would answer a question that we got. So, Lance, uh, if you wouldn't mind reading yep. the question. Okay, so it's from a group who is a little uh, behind, and so they're like, hey, if you'll answer this, it's great. They were discussing Matthew, and mm-hmm. in chapter 19, uh, Jesus talks about divorce. It says, we know you covered the heart of this chapter and the heart of Jesus uh, regarding divorce, but our discussion was around verses 10 through 12 and eunuchs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they say, it seems odd that these verses were included in a section about divorce. Are we missing cultural context? We discussed how eunuchs were probably considered outsiders. But did they marry? Did they divorce? And verse 12 says, let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Is that for the eunuchs or for the outsiders or for everyone? Were they just supposed to accept eunuchs? What does all this mean? Yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> what is funny is the the whole, did we miss something because of cultural context? I feel like for me, that's always the answer. Like, <laughs> you guys are so good at helping me. I was like, well, you got to understand. So it's almost like any question you have, yes, there's cultural context probably at the root. Of, it's really important. Yeah. Yep. We should do a class on that. I don't even know how you learn all that cultural context. I mean, we do how to study the Bible. Mm-hmm. There's some is of that, that in all there. about cultural context, it's though? Not. Yeah. No, but we do say context is king, and we t- we talk about the importance. Yeah. Of so it. where do people go to get? Sorry, well, let's a, answer the question. A let's study answer the Bible, question. Yeah. Sorry, we're not here for that. We're, <laughs> we're always here for that. Well, you know what I mean. Okay, so I think if you're reading in the ESV, the way that it's worded definitely uh, fosters this kind of question. It's like it, not as clear what Jesus means about eunuchs and why he's even talking about that. So if you back up, Jesus is speaking. He's answering a question about divorce, and his answer to the question is. Uh, divorce was never God's plan. God's plan is that uh, two become one, that uh, a man and a woman are made to, once they marry, be together forever. And divorce was only permitted in the time of Moses because of sinful people. And so he's, he's raising the bar in what the Pharisees or anyone else listening uh, thinks about marriage. Marriage is hard and you stick with it. And uh, except he he gives uh, an exception for sexual immorality, infidelity, adultery. Um, and so then the disciples hear this high bar that Jesus raises. And they say in verse 10, uh, if such is the case of a man with his wife, is it better not to marry? They're like, gosh, Jesus, that was hard. Maybe we just shouldn't be married uh, at, in the first place. And so that's when Jesus brings up eunuchs. And he says, there are eunuchs by birth, there are eunuchs made eunuchs by men, and then there are people that choose to be eunuchs. And so that's where the, that's where the question comes from, and there's not clarity. Anybody want to jump in, or you just want me to keep going? Keep going. Yeah, I was say, you, 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 you're going. on a roll, buddy. Okay, you I'll keep this. going. I feel you like I'm just this. doing all the talking. No, I'm on good. the edge of my seat. Okay, this all is right. good. So if you flip over to the New International Version, the NIV, I think it gives a little more clarity that, that opens up why Jesus says this. So I'm going to read verses 11 and 12. In the NIV, Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only to those whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose, this is the difference, choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. And so I think what Jesus is saying here is that uh, there are people who are born and don't have desire for relationship or any of that. There are people who, in this day and age especially, have been made eunuchs physically. Uh, But then there are those like Paul who choose to set aside this part of their life to focus fully on the kingdom of heaven. And that is a unique thing. And so that's a choice. They're not choosing to become castrated. They're choosing to set uh, relationships and sex and all that aside 
to focus on the Lord and his mission. So this isn't a, a literal translation for you. There, there's, this it's is kind figurative. of figuratively speaking. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's helpful. Mm-hmm. That I, I didn't know that. I would have really screwed that up in my smart no. if somebody would But ask. I do think it is Jesus valuing marriage. He's, he's giving us this really high standard for the purpose and value of marriage, which we need to hear. And then he's also giving us this really high view of singleness, mm-hmm. but also it's good to be single. And so if that's what you're called to, um, you know, Jesus was called to that, Paul was called to that, and that's a good thing too. Yeah. And, and in that, like uh, he says, he acknowledges there are people who are born without sexual desire or desire for relationships. And he doesn't, he doesn't say that as if it's bad. He just acknowledges, yeah, there are people like that. And yeah. so. Yeah, you're born that way. Someone makes you that way with persecution or you choose that way. But what, whatever, whatever that is, you can still glorify God with your life. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's good. All right, let's jump ahead to First Peter. It's a new book. And, and I, I know people are probably like, guys, this isn't what we were reading. That, that was supposed to be last week. I know there's some- No, it's just First over- Peter 1 yeah. was yeah. part of last week's last week. reading. I know. I'm just yeah, yeah, yeah. saying we're, we're, we're going to kind of clump this whole book. So we're going to do all of First Peter uh, today, even yep. though it goes, it was part of last week's a little bit. Correct. So, um, I know what, what we've started out each book generally giving some context, just like we said, cultural context matters or clarity. You want to give a little bit of background of Well, this is Peter, Peter, Peter who we love. Yeah. Peter, whenever we're reading the Gospels, I'm always like, Peter, you're the greatest. Um, he's back and forth. He's impulsive. This is Peter. And then we see this is Peter after the resurrection of the Holy Spirit. And you really do see so much wisdom and strength and faithfulness, which just reading this, I loved to just to think through that. Uh, but he's writing about 60 AD, something like that. Um, he is um, on, um, he's outside of Jerusalem now. He's on mission and he's writing from Rome to um, Gentile Christians who are in the area of modern day Turkey. That's where he's writing to. And the Gentile Christians he's writing to are being persecuted. And so really the big picture of Second Peter is um, persecution and suffering and how we are faithful and we live out our faith and we love others like Jesus did because of our future hope. So it's living in light of the future hope we have as Christians, no matter what our circumstances are. Which is always a good thing to be encouraged by. Yeah. All right. So let, let, let's jump in. I, I always, Anything else? I, I, oh, no, I, that was great. I, what struck me this time, and I don't know why, more so than, or I've never thought about this before, but you know, Peter was blue collar. He was a fisherman. Mm-hmm. Whereas Paul was highly educated. And so you read the rest of the New Testament, all these letters that Paul wrote. And I guess I just never have stopped to consider like, Paul's just this regular blue collar fisherman guy. Peter. Who, oh, sorry, Peter. Yes. Uh, who Jesus called and he, he gave his life to Jesus, followed him, and went all in and spent the rest of his life. And so he's just, I don't know, there's something relatable about Peter mm-hmm. uh, in that. And so now, decades later, all his wisdom to, to people who, uh, are, who at one time were outside the people of God, but are now in. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and just the, the transformation of Peter, his, yes. his wisdom, his, um, his ability to be in suffering for the sake of Jesus, which mm-hmm. he could not do. Um, before, which we saw him fail at. I mean, just all the parts of it, his, his true understanding of hope is, is really amazing. Yeah. All right, we're going to jump in. I think for me, one thing I, I had immediately in, in first period is in the greeting when it gets towards the end there, where it talks about, um, you know, according to the, the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit uh, for obedience of Jesus Christ and for uh, sprinkling with his blood. And this idea of like sprinkling with his blood, like what the heck does that like mean? And so I started thinking like, okay, maybe this has to do with like how they worship back then. And then it got me even thinking what worship was like for them. And uh, I know the sprinkling of blood ties to like Old Testament stuff, but mm-hmm. that was, was that still a practice of the early church? Some of those like old things, like right now, how we're like, oh, we want to sing hymns because that's what people have been singing in churches forever. At what point, what are the things that are the practices or the expressions of their worship that they did that have like faded away over time or Mm -hmm. we don't do? Not that there's an answer. That was just something I spent time thinking about. So, and maybe I'm just weird, but 
I don't know, isn't that weird? Well, no, I know. I think that's helpful because it, even like just the sprinkling of blood is, is foreign to us. But I think it's, didn't you talk about like literally how they sprinkle blood when we were in Hebrews? Is that yeah. when you talked about it? The hyssop. So. hyssop. Yeah. yeah. That, Luke, that's, Luke brings up hyssop when we I think that's the, the reference yeah. here yeah. to what he's talking about because he's really going through, I, I love it. It's, this is very Trinitarian. You know, it's the, the father who is saving in this. And and don't Jesus get me wrong. Lord. I'm not saying that I think they were actually sprinkling yeah. blood in their services, but they had right. like practices or things that like were um, maybe not all the Gentiles, but some of the 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 Jewish Christian that had become Christians. I mean, was there? I don't know. Maybe this is just no. I, so I think what he's doing from the very beginning is helping the, these Gentiles see that they're part of this old story, and so. All through it, he is connecting them in their day to this old story. They're now part of the people of God. And so that's why there's all this language, even starting in the beginning. So, I mean, verse one, to those who are elect exiles. Yeah. That is like the elect were Israel. Yeah. All through the old, I mean, they're the people of God. And the exiles, that's connecting them to uh, those that were scattered in uh, in the exile. Mm-hmm. But he's... And the spring of the blood, I, I think, is part of the, this temple, like the, yeah. you know. I think he, he this verse, verses one through nine is sort of the big picture of the rest of the book. And throughout it, you'll see, like Lance is saying, you'll see him draw them Unpack. back into the Old Testament story. And it's really, it's brief references, but there are links to just, re- you are now the people of God. You really are. I mean, Peter's the first one who, who God said, hey, there's, the, the Gentiles are going to be a part of this story now. And he's telling them, you are part of this story. This is your story. He's trying to orient them the whole time. You're part of the story. This is your future hope. And this is what it looks like to be in the story. Which makes me think they must have been studying Mm -hmm. the Old Testament. They they must have been using the Old Testament in these Gentile communities. Because they didn't have the whole thing yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might have had some copies of letters that were being passed around. But they had to be teaching Jesus from the Old Testament. Yeah. Even to Gentiles. Because there are references. He doesn't explain yeah, it. That's right. Which is what we know from what we read. And I know I've said this, I feel like a gazillion times. Like, that's what Jesus spent time doing with his disciples before he yep. ascended, was revealing himself in the scriptures. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's right. That they had. So, yeah, Man. it's like what Matthew did. It's what Hebrews did. It's, yep. it's, it's again what's happening here. It's just not as explicit. There's just references. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I just had a different thought. But um, I mean, I think there were some other good things, obviously, in here. I'm not trying to shortchange it, but. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he also says in verse 10, concerning the salvation, the salvation that's for the Gentiles too, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, they searched and inquired. I mean, he's saying the, these prophets, they knew, you know, because there's all these prophecies that were fulfilled and, you know, your, your grace is going to be poured out. You're going to have renewed hearts. So there's going to be the suffering servant, but they didn't really know what that was going to look like. And he's saying, you're the, it was for you. It was for you, the Gentiles. Yeah, I guess I, I had in mind that because they were teaching from the Old Testament and they had to be because of the way he just references yeah. it without explaining things, yep. that he's saying like, all the things you've been learning, mm-hmm was ultimately for, for you. you. Like you, yeah. you have been part of this story all along and through Jesus and what he did, it, it finds uh, it, its next step in who you are. Which matters because he will get to, you, you live obediently and you, and you live a faithful, holy life now in light of the promise of the return of Jesus, of him being revealed in full glory. That's how we live now. And we can, we can know that that's true because all of God's promises from the Old Testament are true and you're the beneficiaries of it. You're experiencing that now. He'll say, you're, you've tasted it, you know it's true. So trust that his other promises that you haven't experienced fully are also true. Yeah. Yeah, I think one, one, one thing I wasn't going to bring it up, I'm going to go backwards a little bit, is at, and at the end of verse 9 there, where it talks about this idea of obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, is kind of alludes to this already, not yet, mm-hmm. that we're, the thing that we're obtaining is something that's already happened, but we still, it hasn't happened. And so I think that can, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's always good to remember, you have been saved, yeah. you are being, being saved, saved, and you will be saved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, that was uh, 
That is good. Say that one more time. You have been saved. You are being saved, and you will be saved. Yeah, three point sermon right there. <laughs> we got down, down, got down the mountain. Um, yeah, and then he starts introducing this idea of like this this call to be holy. The pre- sets up, I think, here initially this mm-hmm. idea that with the the priesthood of all believers, which we mm-hmm. talked about in that all access series. Said, I think we used some First Peter it was, in that. It was the ver- like the heart of the series. Yeah, yeah the heart of the series. He is, I mean, he is saying you, you are understanding now too. I mean, he, he does talk about this transformation of your whole lives, this tra- transformation of your thoughts. And, you know, he says, focus, you know, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, again, this language of everything that you're doing now, because they are suffering, they're being persecuted. You, you have to set your hope on the future. That's hard to do, you know, when you're in the midst of suffering or he'll also talk about just temptations of the world, worldliness. It's, it's hard to do, but we have to continually do that. Yeah. I think the other thing I was reminded of reading the tail end of that, even where it, it talks about um, just this, uh, you know, the, the grass and the, the grass withers, and mm-hmm. but the Lord remains forever. And, and this word is the good news uh, that was preached to you. Just this idea of the gospel is imperishable. The gospel is like ever. It's it, it's not going to change. It doesn't change. Like that's not what what we see. Uh, it's not like we're waiting for some other plan to come in place. Like right. Yeah. So just the eternal nature of what Jesus did. I don't know, was encouraged by. I think the next thing in there that I was encouraged by is this idea of, uh, you know, how newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. And obviously I was still thinking about the the gospel a little bit there. And uh, just this idea of how sometimes like when we feel, you, you know, you hear people say like, oh, I've never heard scripture taught that way. Or I've never heard people talk about um I don't know the gospel that way, and so it, it it to me is this idea of uh, you know feeling like okay we are experiencing more a, a more pure spiritual milk maybe not something maybe there's a there's probably some context to uh, diluted milk that was used for something I don't know but you like what are you guys talking what are you talking about you're both like, <laughs> no, like no. I was just gonna say I think that he's using that to talk about that you may grow up into salvation again. You are being saved and you will yeah. be. Like, as you have, uh, he, he's using this metaphor to say, like, uh, you need to be growing like an infant. So even Jesus described uh, faith as new life. Like, you need to be born again, right? Um, and so in that, you need to continue to grow and mature, which is, I think, what we talked about in our series, which th- these verses set up the ones we used in that series. Um, so... You need to grow into Christian maturity. And once you have tasted the salvation, it should make you desire more and more and more yeah. of it. You know, you you should understand, like I think in the last book we read, you know, he said, um, you, let's move on from elementary things too. Yeah. There is a time to go deeper and deeper and deeper. There's, there's no end to how yeah. much we can grow and know God and understand and live out our faith in this life. There's always more, which is, which is amazing, but it, it says it over and over. So we don't want to just, oh, we, we know we're saved and now we just go on with our lives. It's like, no, we, we really, there's always more with God. And what he's saying too, is a lot of that's going to be in the midst of suffering. Yeah, That's how we're going to grow. So you're, th- this longing for pure spiritual milk maybe is in your, the way you said it's in the, the, the potency, not the like, the trueness. I don't know if that makes sense. Because, you know, long for there's this idea of, the, well, if there's pure spiritual milk, there's other milk that's maybe not sure. as pure. It's not as, it's, so, I don't know. Sorry, maybe I didn't. We're getting, we're, it's right. We're getting the weeds on something. Well, he's saying pure, so he's calling us to be holy throughout this. Like, you are to be holy because God is holy. You're to be holy because you have new life. And he's saying the verse before that is put away malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. You want pure spiritual milk. You are to be pure. And so you you fill yourself, you fill your life with pure food. Yep. And that's from the Holy Spirit. It's it's knowing the word, it's being community, it's living out your faith. Yeah. Let me 
So, do you guys have anything else to say in two before I bring up something else in, nope. to, in two? Okay, so in maybe I want to make sure I have my notes right here on this, but in, in verse 9, and maybe, is it, I don't know, is this what we use? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Uh, once, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Is it got me thinking as I go back here to the beginning to the those who are exiles of the dispersion, mm -hmm. and we hear um, in the next line he calls them sojourners. I mean, is that that's still us? Like the, we're all. It's like the dispersion didn't end. The, the scattering right. of thing like that's still this this time. So that is, this is kind of written not just to them but to. It's definitely for us. So, we are still yeah. in, it's like we, he, there's this constant, um, there's this pull back to the Old Testament exile and wandering. This is, this is another story, right? Everything is oriented around the exile and redemption by God from the Old Testament and now in the new. And so they're the people of God now, and now they're in another exile. So they are... But, Sojourners. but this is the, the new humanity that we're saved to, the people, right? Yeah. Or no? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But our, our exile is different. Yeah. It's a spiritual exile. It's a longing for the new heavens, new earth. It's, we, it's, it's already not yet of the wilderness, but it is, it's like the Old Testament wilderness, but it's a different kind. It's a spiritual. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. I think that whole new humanity thing is a crazy concept, so... What we're what we're saved into because that's what this is referencing. You know, once you were once not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, I don't know. Yeah, he, he's really calling them to their whole new identity. They were Gentiles, and now they're a part of God's people. And that is all of all of these identity changes. Like this is who you are yeah. now, and then he'll go on to say, so that this is how you live that out. But this is who you are. And it's radically different mm -hmm. for everyone, for the Jew, but really for the Gentile, because they were never an exile before. You know, they were never part of God's people. Okay, so then we get into this whole submission to authority piece here. And this idea of uh, suffering and enduring again, right? So, but if you do good and suffer for it, you endure this is a gracious thing in the sight of God, not just suffering because we sin, but suffering when we... Uh, yeah, they're living in a time of oppression. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, and even these Gentiles. So Rome is the superpower. And so as Rome conquers, they send their people to lead. They tax uh, wherever they are so that they can feed the big machine, right? And so all of your resources in your community are now repurposed. Uh, for the sake of Rome, not just for the sake of your community, and it is oppression in many ways. Uh, so he's writing to people who live in that context, who who live that they understand a foreign oppressor. Yeah, and basically an encouragement, saying like, listen, like when you when you're when you're enduring because of uh, your your faith and like when you're oppressed away, that's that's good in the sight of God. But if you're just being oppressed because of the stupid stuff that you do, it's like yeah. kind of like, well, what'd you expect? That's a really, really important thing for us to contemplate. Yeah. yeah. Are we suffering because we're making decisions that are not good? Or are we suffering because we're doing it for the sake of the gospel and for Jesus? Yeah. It's different. This So this kind of sets up what he's going to go into in chapter three, I think. He's like, wherever you find yourself, whatever the people around you believe, whatever people with authority believe, however things function, you have a call to, to live like Jesus. And so um, that, that means your faith shapes your response. Well, and, and remember this whole, this is a letter, right? This is one letter that's a cohesive letter that they would have read all together, which I like that we're doing this. We're reading it all the same time. So the the titles we've put in there, right? Yeah. These aren't Peter's titles. So really verse verse 11, right? 2, 11, all, all this flows together. It, it's a new section, but that's fine, but it's really just one pretty short letter. And so he says, as, as exiles, like you said, abstain from passions of the flesh, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable 
so that when they speak against you, they may see your good deeds and glorify God. I mean, that's really, then he'll go into what that looks like, but that's what he's calling us to. Remember your future hope, right? Your hope is in the future, your hope is in Jesus. And also he will talk about how Jesus also suffered. So it's, it's all of this in light of future hope that's coming and also Jesus who sympathizes and who has experienced even more suffering than we ever will, even more oppression. Yeah. And a little bit in here, it's about like what we, it's the witness of our, and what we endure and how we suffer is a witness. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and he, I, I like that he, he's writing to Gentiles, but he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable mm-hmm. because he's already said, you're not, you're not like you're, you're a new people. And he's, so he's still identifying yes. the Gentiles as yep. not the people of God, mm-hmm. but you're the people of God. Yeah. All right, let's jump into this next section here. And I think this, this, uh, this probably still has something because it says it starts with likewise in three. Um, I, yeah, that's, I what, that, that's all I'm saying. It's, it's likewise, yeah. likewise, and you'll see that over and over. And that it's, it's a continuation of the same call in the same circumstances. Yeah, and I, I think maybe that's helpful to give context because I, I feel like this is often a scripture that people can go to and misinterpret or misuse or um, uh, th- 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 you're only in three. In three, three, okay, three, one, yeah. Oh, absolutely. This has been used to tell women to stay in abusive marriages. This yeah. has been used by men who want to just have absolute authority, like you just need to submit and call me master, right? I mean, and yeah. it is taken out of context, right? This in the big picture context is, hey, when any, if you're a Christian and you're in a place where whoever has authority over you is persecuting you, um, you still need to do good and let your actions and your character um, draw people to God. That's the hope here. Yeah. And you have a future hope waiting for you no matter what happens in this life. But this is not God telling women to stay with someone who's abusive, right? And it's not t- God telling men you have you know, this control over your wives and they should do whatever you say. That would be completely taking this out of context. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I mean, did you just hear my stomach? I did hear it, I yeah. Like, I thought maybe lunchtime. that was something lunch. from the hallway. Out there. Yeah, geez. I <laughs> oh, was like, man. it's almost time. Well, it is 11.44. Yeah. Right? Maybe I am hungry. Um, yeah, sorry. I don't want to, I, I feel like I wasn't trying to d- just continue trying to... the conversation. Yeah, like, yeah. No, I, I think that. it's good because that is, we have to understand the context of the letter. We also have to understand the context, uh, which we've um, already talked about, which is these. This is a this is a Gentile like cultural world. This is the household codes he's going through again, right? This is right after he talks about slaves and masters mm-hmm. and the government. It's a continuation of these different levels of authority at at this time that we still have today, but at, especially at this time, household yeah. codes. So we've talked about that. We've talked about how women are valued at this time, which is not at all not even considered fully human for a lot of them. And so remember that when you're reading this, because he also will tell husbands, honor your wives, respect your wives. He says, respect the emperor and respect your wives is what he says to men too. And so he's again, trying to say, hey, um, wherever you find yourself, you act like Jesus. You respond like Jesus with self-sacrificing love. And when you do so, you might even be able to share the gospel with people. Yeah. In the context, so uh, one more thing, the context of Abraham and Sarah, I think people see that passage and they're like, he, you know, Sarah calls Abraham Lord. I would just um, go back to Genesis 18 and, and read it. Cause like Lance said, he's trying to orient these people with their story and the story of scripture. Like their story is this story. Yeah. And that section is really where God says, you really are gonna have this baby, this, this child of the promise to Abraham to bless all nations. And they don't, they're old at this point. And she sort of is scoffing like, oh my gosh, my Lord is old. That's what she says. So it's really a funny, it's a funny passage for Peter to refer to, but you, so you need to look at all that context. She was in a hard marriage. There was lots of persecution and difficulty, but she still was faithful and submissive. And because of that, she was the mother of the child that was going to be a part of the blessing to all nations. She's a part of this salvation story. So he's really telling us, hey, whatever's happening, when you are willing to submit, even whenever it's hard, you are part of God's salvation story. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so I think in some of this, it's like when, when this is a, a this is a, pic, a a great picture when things kind of are working well, but we know for a lot of, uh, let's say marriages, it's not always working well. So it's hard to uh, use these words and apply these things when it's not, um, I guess, an ideal situation, like you're saying. But I, I think it's likewise, just even on the husband, this idea of like showing honor uh, to your wife and uh, the implications of what that means. I, I think there's a there's a equal responsibility. It's not as much always a one sided thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like he so. said. So he says likewise. So he's really saying in the same way, in the same way, yeah. and then he'll get to and finally yep. at the end. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably not easy. Yeah, I think another way I've seen this text misused is like uh, I think about my grandmother, the faith tradition that she was. Uh, part of her whole life where they didn't wear jewelry. They, oh, yeah, that's right. They didn't cut their hair. Mm-hmm. They wore very simple clothes. And that's not the that's not what he's saying. You're, you're, you're taking these words completely out yeah. of who they were written to and why they were written. And so you have to understand he's saying, do not let your adorning be external. That's not, that's not Peter saying, don't wear jewelry. He's saying, don't let that be the most important part about how you engage your husband, how you interact with your husband. So he's writing, in this case, to women who, whose husbands are not followers of Jesus. And he's saying, let the most beautiful thing about you be what's inside. Uh, let the way that you respond to and love your husband cause him to have affection for you and wonder, why is she this way? Not because she's all dolled up and spent so much time working on the way that she looks. So, I mean, even Sarah, I mean, she was very, very, very beautiful. She's, I mean, two two kings wanted her and she was given to them. I mean, that's how beautiful she was. But what he's saying, what what was beautiful about her is her submission. And he says, you're her children. So that's that's what's beautiful in God's sight. Yeah. And, And then also, I think the call to husbands is, I mean, you brought it up already, Ted, but like live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And so I know we were, we were joking a few minutes ago before we started about that. Like Rachel and I were going to arm wrestle. We <laughs> did, and I won. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I mean, again, not. weaker vessel just me. I mean, it's like a physical, women yeah. are physically smaller in stature typically. But, but he says, listen, in a, in a culture where, where women don't meet men in stature, uh, both like in importance and, in, and physically, that a husband is supposed to honor his wife because he should look at her and say, we're the same before God. We're co-heirs yeah. of this grace, of this kingdom, of all these things. And so whatever your world tells you, whatever the culture says about your wife, you need to see her with God's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. What it means to be a beautiful woman, what it means to be a difference, you know, differences between the sexes. I mean, the words honor and heir, I think are a little bit foreign to us, even culturally, but this is a shame on our culture and to honor someone is a big deal. Yeah. You know, I think we hear that and we're like, okay, like just like be nice and like, don't be rude. But to honor someone, I mean, that was their whole structure. You honored those who have authority over you usually. And so he's really calling husbands to something very countercultural here. And also heirs, that's for, you know, the men mostly. You're the, and the heir is the firstborn son but women are co-heirs because we are in Christ. Yeah. So also treat them as heirs. I mean, it's really and I a just, lot than we just read it. Yeah, and I think even practically for, for husbands today, like what, what does it actually look like in your actions to honor your wife, not just say you, in something you say? And so, I mean, yes, saying, yeah, for, saying that your words obviously matter and, and how you honor, but even like, it just starts bringing a list of things. It's like, oh man, that when you show honor through your actions, not just your words, I know it just mm-hmm. it changes things. Yeah, for husbands and wives, both. Like how, yeah. how do you live out this self-sacrificing love? How is Jesus our example and how we treat our spouses? And he says at the end, so that your prayers might not be hindered. I mean, Gosh. that's a big yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you don't act this way, your relationship with God is affected. Yeah. How we treat in our, you know, even what you were saying in the very beginning with the question from Matthew, marriage is a big deal. And how we honor and respect and submit to our spouse affects even our relationship with God. And he brings up your prayers being hindered, that your prayers may not be hindered a few times in here. So I was like, mm-hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was just a, a common shorthand that he just used 
to express like, you know, how, how important it is or um, like, well, if you don't do this, it's, it's kind of, it doesn't, uh, like if you suck at this part, you suck at all of it yeah. kind of thing. No, I mean, he heard Jesus say things like, uh, forgive others so that the Lord will forgive you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he, he spent the, all those years listening to the teachings of Jesus. And that's why he says this because he, Jesus said the same thing. You know, it's, it's the idea from James, faith and works are connected. If we have authentic faith, then we love God with all that we are and we love people. And, and our example for that and how we do that is, is Jesus. And so it doesn't mean that if you like have a bad day and you like are rude to your spouse that like you can't go before God, it's this, it's, but it is this call to an authentic relationship, a desire and an attempt and a practice of loving. All right, guys. I feel like we haven't I haven't done us justice in, in moving on, but I feel like we gotta we gotta keep going uh, here. Um, and I feel like we might be skipping over some stuff that people may have questions. We about. always are. So yeah. So just email us, and we'll 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 get back to it. Um, uh, uh, yeah. And four. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just this continuation. I mean, he, then after he calls us, what he calls us to, he reminds us us that Jesus did this. Yeah. Jesus Jesus went before us and did it. And so we are imitating him. We're becoming more like him whenever we love and serve and submit. Yeah. Well, he, say, he says, uh, love one another, show hospitality to one, uh, one another, serve one another in order that in everything God might be glorified through Jesus Christ. That kind of sums up mm-hmm. that chunk, at least for me there. That's a good reminder. I definitely left some things out. That wasn't word for word. Uh, but you, you get the point. We got it. Okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, so let's, let the, then he finishes it up. I feel like we just always skipped over before, but it's okay. I, I mean, again, these are just more practical yeah. ways he's describing the same thing. Mm-hmm. He, yep. Your life should be different because of your faith in Jesus. You are a new people. You're no longer like you were. And as new people, that affects your behavior in every relationship. Yep. And it's all the future hope. I mean, yep. you know, that you may obtain the blessing. I mean, yep. it's... And so here, the um, in the last one, I mean, I'm assuming I didn't go back and check the word as a... Fel, uh, the, this this idea of elder, uh, is this like the elders in the church? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, is what, what they're talking, not just older people. Yep. Um, don't do it for gain, right? Mm-hmm. It's all self-sacrificing love. Yeah. It says, being examples... So that when the chief shepherd, when Jesus appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I mean, it's all in light of the future. Because Jesus, I'm I mean, keep that's saying that the because... quintessential, humble, self-sacrificing love. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so at the proper time he may exalt you. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. All right, worked. cool. Well, there was First Peter... I think we, we we got we got through it. Sorry if we missed some things that you guys had. Oh, you got something. Well, I just just to end. I mean, he says, you know, I've written briefly. This is this is brief, which I think we should read this over and over again. It's very very convicting and good. Um, declaring this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. I mean, the grace of God isn't a happy easy life. The grace of God is is sometimes suffering and being persecuted but living out our faith in the Holy Spirit, you know, with the example of Jesus, knowing that we have this future hope and glory that's coming, that's sure.